Let's see. All right. Um, welcome to part two of lecture four. And last week I left off, I'd finished discussing what the first normal form was, which essentially means there is no repeating groups of rows, all the rows are populated, and you've picked out potential candidate keys. That's first normal form. Second normal form is where we start hitting some of those more cryptic descriptions. But the very first rule that's really easy to remember for second normal form is, it must be in first normal form. You can't be in second normal form unless you're in first normal form. You know? So, literally, it's self-explanatory on that one. The second one is every non-key attribute is fully functionally dependent on the entire primary key. That means you're not allowed to have columns that don't depend on the entire primary key. So if there's one column that is only defined by part of the key, that's not second normal form. Every non-key attribute must be defined by the entire key and not only part of the key. It's basically the previous point reworded. And that means also that there's no partial functional dependencies. So the three points all mean the same thing. It's three different sets of wording, depending on how you want to look at it. Now, this is, I'm going to bring back my table that I had up for you guys, which is this one here. This one was set up to be in first normal form. We had a candidate key picked. Every column was self-contained. There was no repeating groups of rows. And when we look at the columns again, you got order ID, order date, customer ID, customer name, customer address, product, product description, finish, standard price, and quantity. So now I'm going to skip back to where I was. These are the same things, just without the data. And here's the functional dependencies. And it's actually doing it with the little arrows is actually really handy. So the order ID has the following columns are functionally dependent on it. The order date, the customer ID, because the customer ID is defined by the order. The customer name and the customer address, that's fully dependent on the order ID. The customer ID has the customer name and the customer address. The product ID has the description, the finish, and the standard price. And then the combination of the primary keys is the product ID and the order quantity. So the quantity is fully dependent on both parts of the primary key. All of this stuff is only dependent on the order ID. And all of this stuff is only dependent on the product ID because you can define these things without ever knowing who the customer is or when an order was placed. Same thing here, you could theoretically have an order with a customer and not know anything about the products. Therefore, these are partially dependent on the whole key. Since the whole key is these two columns, the product ID, and I'm actually going to aim my camera that way. I have no idea how that lines up, but we're going to go with it. So yeah, so since our primary key right now is these two columns, these are partially dependent on this. This is partially dependent on this. And the quantity is actually dependent on the two to put together. So when we talk about things being fully dependent, only the quantity is fully dependent on the entire primary key. Everything else is partially dependent, as in these can be defined without order ID. This stuff can be defined without the product ID. So what we end up doing is to bring it to second normal form is we have to get rid of partial dependencies. How do you do You take that big, long data table and you break it up into smaller pieces. The less redundancy you have in your data, the better. So we took this big, long row of information and we broke it down into three smaller rows. So ordered, ordered quantity is dependent on the order ID and the product ID. We already established that was good. The product description, finish, and price it only depends on the product ID. So we exploded that out. The customer address, name, ID, and order date is only dependent on the order ID. Now, in this one here, there's still an issue. That's going to get resolved in the third normal form. This is technically second normal form because customer ID is not part of the primary key. These are known as transitives. We'll be taking care of the transitives in a minute. So we got rid of the partial dependencies. That means there's no data anymore that depends only part of a primary key. All the data now depends on the entire primary key. That's the second normal form. It's starting to look more like tables. 
Which brings us to the third normal form. Rule number one. You can't be third normal form unless you're second normal form. Starting to see a pattern in here, right? So just like Dragon Ball. You can't be one color unless you're the previous color before. I just don't remember what the order of the colors are. And no, I don't care. Now, the next thing is there must be no transitive dependencies. So if I go back to the previous slide just for a second, down here we have transitive dependencies. In other words, even though customer ID is not part of the primary key, there are parts of the data that still depend on it. That's known as a transitive. So to be in third normal form, you've got to get rid of that. And there's the actual official definition. A trans it's called a transitive dependency because the primary key is a determinant of another attribute, which in turn is a determinant for another attribute. If I go back here, okay, order ID determines the date and the customer ID. Customer ID determines the name and the address. Thus, the order ID determines customer ID. That's the first level, which defines these guys, which is third level. You can't have three levels in one table. So, what's the fix for that? You're going to take the, this trends of dependency and break it out to its own table. So we end up with something like this, where we're aware that the order ID and the order date is self-contained. The customer ID, the customer name, and the customer address is self-contained. So what we want to do is we're going to take that, break it down into two pieces. So now the order only has the order ID, the order date, and the customer ID. And there's another table that's for customers, which has the ID of the customer, the name, and their address. So that's the breakdown of how you take the that big, long table, and you blow it up to its smallest con constituent pieces. And at this point, you're able to change any piece that's not a key without affecting the rest of the database. The customer changes their name. You change it in one place. The price of the product changes. You change it in one place. The color changes. You only need to update it once. Now, if we were going to turn that into a diagram, which if you have been reading those PDFs that are attached to the units, you've seen some of these. Yes. No. It's considered good enough. After third normal form, there's something called Boyce Cod, fourth, fifth, sixth, and then there's three more. Yeah, well, in this case here, this, this is actually a really lazy example because really the address should be broken down to its constituent pieces anyways. But for all intents and purposes, based on the sample of data that was given to us, this is good enough. The, this diagram shows the relationships. The customer can place zero or more orders. That's what this is saying, zero or more orders. An order must have a customer and only one customer. So the symbol on each side of the line refers to the table at the other end of the line. So this symbol refers to customer, this symbol refers to order. So a customer can have zero or more orders. Each order can belong to one customer and must have a customer. Okay, each order can have, m at least must have at least one item, but it can have many items. Each item can belong, each order line can only belong to one order. And same thing here with the products. A product can be placed in zero or more order lines, but each order line must contain NVIDIA card. Hold on. Those of you that aren't used to having multi-head cooked up to a laptop have never experienced this. It's a good time. It does this to me at work too. Now this says it's each order line must have at least one product. Each product can have zero or more order lines. In other words, you can have an order that can, doesn't contain every product because you might not buy everything. Can you imagine you go to Ikea and you say, I want one of everything. Just put it on my credit card. Right? That's not how it works. You go and you buy, you know, cinnamon rolls. Best product at Ikea. The rest of it breaks. Um, but yeah, so that's the, the results of a third normal form. The whole goal of normalization is to break, it, break down the data so it's in its smallest constituent pieces. The smaller the pieces it is, the better. Now, there's also a rule that you don't want to go too far. 
Because if the data is broken down too much, then it's a nightmare to write code to work with. So it, you're trying to find the happy medium. But the goal is, when all is said and done, you don't change data in more than one place at a time. You want to change the description of something, you change it in one place. You want to change the name of someone, you change it in one place. That's the goal. So if you were changing the standard price for a given product, you only have to do it once in this table. Instead of having to update all the order lines to match, you do it here. Um, customer changes their name for whatever reason. They decide they don't like being called Frank and they want to be called, I don't know, Vinny. You can change their name, but you only have to do it in one place. So that's third normal form. That's what's considered good enough for 95% to 98% of the cases. The next normal form is known as Boyce Cod. And I don't cover a lot of time on Boyce Cod because we used to, and it ends up being a waste of time. Um, however, Boyce Cod is the next step past third normal form. It's designed for handling very specific edge cases. So it's known as in the industry as normal form three and a half. Textbook authors will never call it that. Those of us that do this for a living call it that. It's the difference, right? And when there's more than one candidate key to resolve a situation, that's when Boyce Cod comes into effect. And the plain English answer for what Boyce Cod is is when every attribute or field depends on the key and nothing but the key. In other words, every single column is defined by the key and no, no other key, and there's only one key. That's Boyce Cod. Uh, are you ever going to be tested on that? I think they even pulled those questions off the exam. Now, that's the end of that one. Well, like I said last week, I didn't have a lot left. I just needed to finish it this week. The important part is what comes next which is going to be the demonstration on the board of towards the assignment. Um, for the exam, just so you know, for tests and exams, how much do you have to understand about normalization? You have to understand the definitions and the meanings of it. In other words, what's third normal form? What is a candidate key? What's a partial dependency? What's a transitive dependency? If you can define those, you're going to do just fine on the tests and the exams. Okay. Now, I gotta re-aim my camera, which it won't let me do while it's recording. Cool. All right, now. Yes, I pulled up the text editor. Now, every term, I always use the same example for this because it has nothing to do with the assignment, but it covers a lot of the same concepts as the assignment. And what I use is the pet adoption agency. So I'm going to go and turn on the lights so you can see the board properly, of course, which of course is going to make the screen paler. Wish I could turn on just part of, part of the lights. Great. Okay. So what's going to happen is we're going to describe what would be needed for a pet adoption agency. So think SPCA, Ottawa Cat Rescue, whatever the heck applies to dogs. I'm not a dog person, as you can tell. Um, you know, whatever applies. And we're going to define that this will be the same process as you're doing roughly with the assignment, uh, although you've actually been given more detail than the starting point. So what we need to do first is we want to define the rough entities. So when we think about the entities, what are the objects, things, places that are involved when you think about a pet adoption agency? This is when you, so at this point you guys start, you know, lifting your hand and saying things out loud because it's a now interactive moment in the group. And they're, they're, usually I don't make fun of you too hard during this. So pet adoption agency, what are some of the entities you would encounter? That's an attribute. Okay, we're sure we go with type. This is always fun because I always find it entertaining and, and see what people actually miss. Color is an attribute. You describe it. You're describing something. You're not stating something. That's a sex. That's still an attribute, 
right? You're a human. You're insert gender here. Whatever the heck they may be. Yes. There we go. Usually that one gets forgotten. People worry so much about the, f they lose the forest for the trees. I'm just going to call it pet, just to keep it simple. Okay, so we've got pet, we've got a breed, we've got a type of animal. It's an, ado an adoption agency. What else is involved? That's it. We're st you're still thinking attribute. You want to think about the big things. Not. I don't want you to describe the things. I want to tell you to tell me what the things are. Okay, I have three hands at the same time. I think you came up. You moved first. That's usually an attribute more than a pick list. Okay, you were next. Okay, employees. There was a hand there. Okay. But you're still paying 385 bucks. Again, there's a hand in the back. Adoptees. But think about it, the, top, the adoption agency has something that flips on the other way around too, right? There's people that drop off animals too. Um, they're definitely not donors. Um, because I've dropped off animals at the SPCA a couple of times. My garage, cats love my garage. I've picked up crates of kittens repeatedly in my garage. It's, it's cute, but you know, I, I already have four cats. I don't need more. There was a hand there, and then I think I saw one over there. Uh, I'll put employees and volunteers into the same bin. Was there a hand over here somewhere? No? Was there a hand on that side? Because obviously I'm focusing more down the middle. Anybody on this side come up with anything? Okay. Sure, that's a new one. Locations, there we go. That's the one I was after. There's one more that you might not think of. A lot of people don't think of. Let's see if... They're what? Uh, oh, you're talking about uh, their bin? Like their... Yeah. Um... We're going to call it a kennel. Okay, there's one more that's really important. Now, has anybody actually ever adopted an animal from an adoption place, even here at the college where you can get two cats for the price of one? No, really, 188 bucks, two cats, fixed, microchipped, teeth cleaned, everything. Yeah, just look it up on the website. So there's a couple of hands, you. No. Anybody else back there? No? All right. There's one more thing. When you go through this process, normally you get a health check. That means they've had medicals done, various procedures, including everything from the vet inspection to needles, the big old snipperoo, right? I got two that are about to get their nuts cut off at home. It's great. Right? So, so far, here's some stuff we identified. We identified things, such as animals, Places, such as locations. Events, such as medical history. So we've got all major types of entities you'd find out in the world. So what we do next is we tend to want to start describing it a little bit. And the type of animal I'm going to leave off for the time being. Same thing with breed. Because technically, those are just reference tables. No. Type of animals, cat, cat, dog, fish. Breed is, you know, a Samoyed dog versus, uh, that's the breed. It's a Samoyed dog versus a Scottish fold cat. Oh, that, that we're, we're about to go into the attributes, so I'm trying to answer his clarification. So you're, you're, you're the type and the breed is two different things. The breed is dependent on the type. No, those are all entities. And the, yeah? No. Pet is the Fluffy the cat. Charlie the dog. Charlie 
the Golden Lab Dog. Or you could also have Charlie, the Himalayan cat. Right? Type of animal is like saying, you're a human, not a chimpanzee. Right? We s roughly look the same. One of us doesn't throw shit at people. Most of the time, humans don't. Um, the breed, on the other hand, you know, when you start talking about animals, you got fish, birds, you know, rodents, rabbits, you know, small furry things, cats, dogs, insert other kinds of animals you can adopt. And each of those will have their own sets of breeds. There are a few breeds that overlap where you get the same name for cats and dogs, but really, it's, you don't get a lot of overlap between the two. You know, there's no such thing as a Samoyed cat. I'd love to see one. Or a Scottish folded dog. That could be cute to watch too, you know. But, yeah, so those are, you know, that's the difference there. Now, since those are reference tables, I'm not going to take a lot of time breaking them down because really a reference table is just a list of values that's self-contained and controlled. I am going to focus, however, on the pet. Now, on the pet, now we're going to start talking attributes. What do you use to describe a pet? There you go, name. Would you believe that's the first time that's come out right at the beginning? Ever? I've been using this example now for five years. Two terms per year at least, and it's the first time names come out first. Age is next. You age or data on approximate the problem with animals, especially an adoption agency, is the date of birth is always dodgy, right? Somebody said color, right? What else would you see? Okay, wait, what was the other one? Okay. Now, gender gets tricky with cats and dogs, and it's not tricky the way it is with people. It's a different kind of tricky, because technically pets have four genders, right? Male, female, neutered, and spayed. Technically, a spayed cat is not the same thing as a female cat, legally. Apparently, when the plumbing gets pulled, they lose their status as a full-blooded whatever the heck they were before. Right? So, sex is not a gender. Like, a lot of people will say male or female. Like there's more than more male or female. There's male, female, and then privates removed. So a lot of people will use, there's two ways of setting this up in the systems. It's either you'll have sex and then neutered, or they'll use gender with four options. Now, biologically, I'm not touching that. Not even going there. Biologically, as opposed to there, it's two different things. That's as far as I'm going down that rabbit hole. Now, what else do you have when you think about a pet? Sure, that's another one. Let's go with coat type. Because then there's also optional things. I know what happens if it's a bird? There's no fur. Uh, yeah, sure, we'll go with this position. Is it a hell cat like my daughter's cat? Eh? Yeah. Yeah, a disposition, same thing as behavior. Size? Uh, sure. Disposition means their attitude. Are they a cat? Uh, for example, is it a cat that sits there and tries to eat your eyes while you sleep because they're nasty and evil? Or is it a cat that likes rubbing his ass in your face because he loves you lots? Because I've got four cats. Trust me, I've got four different personalities. Uh, sure, that's different. Medical issues, let's go with that. All right, I think I'm going to pull the plug on the pet for now. That's enough detail for the example of what I'm after. Diet's there. 
Yeah, no, diet's actually not bad because you could actually have, um, depending on the animal's health issues, you may actually have to swap their food. Um, I had a cat once that had that couldn't handle food with ash in it. Like the ash, you know, when you process cat food, they burn it and how much is left behind is ash. And the higher the ash percentage, the, the more certain kinds of things are in the food. And if there's too much ash, they start forming crystals and they pee crystals and bleed all over the place. Basically, it's the same thing as passing kidney stones nonstop as a human. So diet is important to know. Okay. Now, employees and volunteers. We're going to keep this one fairly short. Name. Name. Age. Gender. A. Hey? Yeah, this is so good that's not getting recorded. You can't hear you. Yeah, uh, possibly. But that could just be the primary key too, depending how we decide to handle it. Uh, we're not doing payroll. We're not doing HR. Yeah, position. No, not allowed. You're not allowed to keep that on a, an employee. Unless it, unless it, there's special accommodations, you're not allowed by law to keep track of an employee's medical issues. Unless it's affecting their performance. Okay, like I said, we're staying away from HR. Which size falls under HR? Sure. Email. Phone. Address. And I'm just going to write down address for now as is. Okay, good enough. Adoptees. There you go. That's pretty much what I was after. Except there's one more flag. Are they an adopter or a drop-off? What happens if they're both? That's happened. That's happened to me, actually. I dropped off a cat once that walked in my front door. I didn't know what this cat had, so I didn't want it getting my cat sick. So I took it to the SBC and I said, if nobody adopts it, let me know. My mother-in-law is looking for a cat. I'll pay the fees. But, you know, I'd rather have, you know, if in case it's lost. So, I'll just put down adopt T for now. Um, because if the person is not adopt, you could do this a three-way flag or something. Suppliers. Believe it or not, a lot of this is going to repeat itself again. Except for the supplier, we don't care about that. Ta-da. There might be one other thing that we have for the supplier. Yeah, type of product. I mean, you wouldn't want to buy a cat food from the litter supplier. Right? You might not want to buy dog food from the, you know, the guy that supplies the sleeping shots. So, you know. Okay, now locations. So locations is fairly straightforward. That one gets even simpler. It's the exact same thing literally as the supplier. Because except for the type of product. You have a name of the location. You got an email address and a phone number, usually for each location. And you have an address. Straightforward. It's easy. As you can see, there's a lot of repeating patterns in all of this. Okay, the kennel. The kennel's a little weird. And I'll explain that one in a minute. And usually it's not always called kennel. Sometimes it's called cage. Sometimes it's called something else. Every term it's a little different. I'm just going to put in a tag for location for now. Because once I start diagramming on the board, it'll start making more sense. And then you got the medical history. Medical history is actually pretty complicated. But normally the things you really want to worry about is a handful of things. When you track medical history, what are the three things you should always track for medical history? Whether you're an animal or a human. Eh? That, that's a, that's, that falls under one of the categories of something I'm after. That's still a category of something. 
the three things we want to track is who, what, and where. Sometimes why. Basically, the, you know the magical W's that we learn all about, the five W's? You need to know who did what to what animal, when, and what was done. And maybe a why was it done. So, Well, how it starts getting into the, oh, we neuter the dog. Really? Well, that's not necessarily medical history. That could be part of the medical history. That'd still be who did it, when did it happen. How was it abused? There'd be a, a final set on here, which would be notes. There's one last thing called notes. Now, this medical history is a really good example of a specific kind of data structure called a log. Whenever you log data in the database, it's always going to be who did what when and did it to what. Literally, this is the standard log. In this case, we're calling it a medical history, but it's actually a medical log. It's the same thing. Okay, so we got all our bits and pieces all sorted out. Again, I'm going to get back to the type of animal and the breed in a bit. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start diagramming a little bit now. So, you know when you're doing your assignment right now where I gave you, all oh, these are all the things that we know about this. You basically have to do the same thing we just did. We have to sit there and go look at all the different pieces and saying, what does this actually belong to? Is this actually important? How should it be connected to everything else? It's the same process. It's just this time we worked in a white room instead of a, a finite list. So I'm going to put down pet on the board. And because I'm recording this, I actually have very... Eh? Yeah, there's my, I got some very limited space for the recording. I got to stop at this marker right here. That's why I've made a line here earlier. This is my uh, stage. So I got to get everything to fit inside of this. So pet. So now we're going to put in the pet's name. What else did we have on there? Age, date of birth. Now, this one is a little sketchy too because honestly, age and date of birth are essentially the same thing, right? What's an age? Now minus date of birth. So do we really need to track both? With the vets, they'll often just take a best guess. You know, oh, this kitten's about seven years old, so probably born whatever, seven months, seven, seven months ago, so sometime in March. It is. Therefore, do you, do you store the derived attributes? No. So we can actually get rid of age. Oh, man, I want to, I'm just going to check, make sure my recording's still going. Okay, we're good. All right, color. Every term color is always a big debate. Not about how I spelt it, because I spelt it like a proper Canadian. You have a question? They're going to be they're they're actually parent tables, uh, because you don't want Susie at the front desk typing in Himalayan every single time Himalayan gets come in. They want her to pick it from a list. They're reference tables. Foreign key of this. Yeah, I'll, I'll be diagramming it in a minute. So we got color, we have weight. Gender. Sorry, I'm not writing any bigger, but I do have limited space. Good news is it's being recorded in 720p. So you'll be able to, I'll, I'll, when, I, when I produce the recording, I'll make it full screen, this part. Uh, um, coat type. That is one I've never heard before. Coat type. Size. 
diet. Uh, I thought we had another word in here. Disposition's missing. Okay, so we have our pet. Now, something we haven't done right off the bat, let's look at this data right here. Do we have anything in here we could use as a primary key to uniquely identify an animal? Go ahead and try. Yeah? How many dogs have you seen called Charlie? Sure. But what happens if you have a cat called Charlie and a dog called Charlie both born in March sometime and we don't know the exact day? So they both get so... so starts getting, what happens if it's a bird called Charlie? He doesn't have a coat type. So what's the answer to this? Throw in a sorghum key. Done. Problem solved. You have a primary key now. Congratulations. Is this red marker better? Oh, yes. Oh, every year. I can never get it. And you know how many markers I've thrown out over the years? Many. All right, so that's our primary key. It's the ID. All right, I'm going to put down, the next one I'm going to put down is um, type. and breed. Now, these are reference tables. And it's entirely possible we'll actually have overlapping type uh, breeds. Because there are a few breeds that actually, the name of the breeds shared between cats and dogs. So, since it's a reference table, we're going to put in our basic structures. However, now things get a little more complicated because we're going to have some foreign keys. And the foreign keys define some of the child tables. Now, breed is a child of type. Because each breed belongs to a specific type of animal. Just don't mind my terrible crow's foot. Each type of animal can have many breeds, but each breed can belong to only one type. Now, the pets. Do we really need to track both type and breed? Or just do we need to track the one on the pet? Realistically, you only need the breed because if you know the breed, you know the type. Reduce how much you're, con you're containing. Just like that. Now we have a type, we have a breed, and we have our pet. We just took care of the first three entities we're discussing. Now I'm going to put in, so here's where you can get rid of a lot of data redundancy. What's the difference between an adoptee, a drop-off person, an employee, and a volunteer? Yeah, so what, what is the difference between them other than one or two things? There's, for the employee, there's a position and an employee ID. We still have to have an ID for each row. Therefore, we can piggyback on that. Therefore, at this point, it's almost all identical. So instead of calling it employees, volunteers, we'd have four tables. What happens if you have a volunteer that ended up adopting? Suddenly, they're duplicated in the system. Yes? Speak up just a little. I hear your voice isn't caring. Yeah.
Well, the each row should have, even if they're in separate tables, you may get duplicate IDs, but they may have different meaning because they're in different bins. It's like saying there's a John next door and a John in this room. It's not the same John, even though they have the same first name. Same idea. So when you look at employees, volunteers, adoptees, and drop-offs, they're essentially all the exact same thing. They really are. Or people. Or persons. Or pick a, pick, pick a pluralized word. Because the adoptees and the drop-offs may not be users, right? So they're not really users. They're just people. Or persons, depending on what nomenclature you want to use. Okay, persons, because it holds many person. Each person is a person. Uh, theoretically, yes. We could do it that way. That's one choice we have. Um, the first thing I'm going to do, put in my primary key. There, that's over with. There are tables in third normal form. There's only one column. We're already in third normal form. Okay, we have a name. We have an age, but realistically age is calculated, so really should go with date of birth. I'm just going to call it DOB just to save on writing. Gender. Email. Now, I'm just going to put a star next to address for the time being because addresses are a little more complicated. You also got a uh, phone. Now, so far we've duplicated all the bits and pieces, right? That's, a sh that's shared between all four of those groups. The only thing that's unique between them all is the type of record they are. So in theory, We could do something like this. That's got to be the loudest hallway I've had in a long time. So, person type. Because you can have combinations of person types, right? You could have an employee, a volunteer. You've got a person that's adopting. you got a person that's dropping off. You could have a person that's also a drop-off and uh, whatever. You could also have a donor, a person that gives charitable donations every month. There's a whole kinds of people you might want in your system. What this does is it allows you to classify them and avoid people having to pick. You could have this set up with a bunch of Booleans. Oh, they're this type, this type, this type, but not that type, this type, and not that type. Or you could choose for them to have just the one entry, which normally the human brain tends to want to classify things in single bins. It's easier to manage. So you got person types, just like that. Then you make them optional. Right? right now we haven't talked about mandatory and not mandatory yet, or we haven't even talked about data types yet. That comes after this step. So are there a few different things? The one, one of them was position. That was mentioned earlier. Right? Position only applies to volunteers and employees. Uh, now, if you look at this, you look at the screen there, you've got suppliers. What's the difference between a supplier and everybody else? None. Could be person type supplier. We're going to keep that simple for now. We're just going to call it supplier products. Realistically, there could be a whole pile of things that are related to that, but I'm going to keep it simple to just, you know, this is what the supplier gives us. End of story. Okay.
Now, there is a relationship between person and pets. I'll take care of that in a bit. Because depending how you want to handle it, it gets really complicated. I'm going to talk about locations next. So, we have locations. Again, address is special. I'll get back to that one in a bit. Okay, this is the location. We haven't connected it to anything yet. Because there's a f locations can be used in more than one place. And the first, the other thing we have on here is the kennel. Can each kennel, can any kennel exist on any location? Or can each specific kennel exist at only one location? Can only exist in one location, right? It's not the TARDIS. It can't be in more than one place at once. Each location each kennel must belong to one location. Each location can have many kennels. Which brings us back to our pet. By the way, don't do what I just did. It doesn't come off. <laughs> each kennel, each pet's in one kennel. You can't have the pet in more than one kennel. You know, if the pet's in more than one kennel, you got bigger, you got big problems. So this does a connection. So now, now what do we know? We know, we know the animal. We know what kind of animal it is, what breed it is. We know where this animal is located. We don't have a connection yet between persons and the pet, right? So we've got two unrelated entities in that database, and it's entirely possible that the entities would be unrelated. It's, it's possible. Not likely, but it's possible. However, and I ran out of room. Okay, medical history. That's the one I said that gets complicated because depending on how you want to use this, we could actually take this away from being a, just a medical history and just turn it into history. I mean, real history, what's the difference between this animal was dropped off at this location on this date, uh, two days later they were checked out by a vet, the next day they had their nuts cut off, then they spent a, three days in recovery, and then a week later they were adopted. It's an event history, so therefore it's just a straight up history. So we could get rid of the word medical and just call it history. And now we have a history. And the history covers absolutely everything you'd ever want about the animal. So what do we need to know? We know we need to know history timestamp. When did it happen? We need to know the who. Believe it or not, that little jump actually is a symbol. They actually, a lot of diagram software will have the little jump symbol. Okay, we know who did it. We also need to know who it was done to, or in this case, what it was done to.
Oh, backwards. So now we have when, who, what, what kind of what. We end up having a different kind of what in a minute, and then we have notes. I'm going to put down notes next. And I'm just going to write it in blue because I don't really have a lot of blue on here. Realistically, this should be another reference table is history type. Let's pretend I'm actually going to take history type and explode it out to its own table. I'm running out of room. So, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. All right. So, we just diagrammed what we wrote up as a point form list. Broken down fairly well. There are some things you should be now doing at this point, once you've done this. And I'm only going to do it with one of the tables, and I'm going to do it with the pet table, which at this point you should be assigning data types and whether or not the data is required. So, should a pet always have a name? Yes. Okay, so therefore it's not null. Saw a hand. Why did I put it in red? What did you say? What about the ID? Yeah. Yeah. This pet can have many history entries, but each history entry is only for one pet at a time. So this pet can have many. That's a crow's foot at this end. But each, any given history is only for one pet at a time. And you can't have a history without a pet. Okay? The age. Sometimes we just don't know. Right? The age or the date of birth. We may not know at all, so they take a best guess. So is it nullable? Probably. Because we don't know. The color. Now we should always know what color it is. Weight. We should always know. Gender. <sighs> Nice. Wow. That's taking a lesson home in a hurry. Uh, coat type may not apply, depending on what kind of animal it is. Size, depending on the kind of animal, size doesn't always apply. When you talk about a dog, you got, you know, big, medium, football. And then the size, one size smaller than that, which my cat would actually try to kill. One of my cats would actually try to kill. It was hilarious watching him hunt down chihuahuas. It was the best thing ever. He never actually hurt them. He just pinned them to the ground and sat on them. Uh, size may not apply. Diet. They may not have a special diet. Maybe they just eat cat chow all the time. Or puppy chow. Medical issues. That should be not null. Because even if you say no medical issues, it's still important to know. So it's not null. Disposition should be not null. Breed. Cannot be null. Yep. Actually, in theory, yeah, there's such thing as called a uh, um, mongrel. It's considered a breed. Same thing with the kennel. It might not be in a kennel yet. Right? It just got dropped off. It hasn't been assigned its own bin yet. So therefore, the bin may not apply. Or they may just have a special kennel called holding, depending how you want to handle it. So we'll leave the kennel knowable. Hand in the back. Not null means it's required. You must have this information when you fill in the data. Nullable means, honestly, we don't, the size doesn't apply. I mean, if you're talking about lovebirds, all freaking lovebirds are the same size. They're loud, they're obnoxious, they're hateful, but, you know, they're all the same size. Well, we don't always know the age, right? So when you first, they first bring it in, you don't know how old this animal is. So therefore, the per you're dropping off a cat, and if you looked at one of our cats we have right now, He's six months old, but he's this long. He's a runt. So he looks like he's three months old. So people really don't know. So the vet does an examination, looks at their teeth, looks at other body parts, and determines the age of the animal based on the physical characteristics. Therefore, the age is optional at the beginning because we really don't know. So here we've identified, you know, what's required, not required. That's part of the process also. 
The next step of the process is when you think about the name, after you've determined what's required and not required, what do you think about next? What data types? Right, so now we've identified the attributes. We've identified which ones must be there or must, don't need to be there. The next step is figuring out the data types. Now, the ID, I'm not going to put anything next to that because depending on what database system you're using, the data type changes. If you're using Microsoft SQL Server, it's a data type called identity. In MySQL, it's just an integer with an extra attribute on it, an integer that auto increments. Postgres, you have the choice of integer with identity always or big serial. Each server does differently, so I'm not going to talk about the data type for the primary key because it depends on what you're working with. However, the name, you know, you're probably going to use a varcar because, you know, varcar is the easiest to work with. How big varcar do you think we need for an animal's name? Okay, 25 is fine. I'll accept that. Age. What do you think an age would be? How big? How old do you think these cats can get? <laughs> it could be a, it could be a nint or a float or a decimal, right? I mean, we don't need to track down to subatomic level how long this animal's been around. Yeah, exactly. So if we're storing the date of birth, then we just need to put in a date. If we're actually storing the date at uh, the age, we'd use a decimal. Or numeric, they're the same thing depending on what server you're working with, they're, they're interchangeable. So I'm gonna put in a numeric. Numeric is special because it takes two parameters. The first parameter is size, the second one is precision. So if you say numeric three, that means this number can contain three digits. If you say three comma one, No, three numbers, one is reserved for the decimal, so you're allowed to put in 99.9. .9. So, so this is the total number of digits in your number. This is how many are reserved for decimal places to the, to the right of the number. There's more coming for the assignment after this. His loss, hope his partner didn't leave. Color. Yeah, we could go var car, we could go you know, a drop-down list, depending how you want to do it. You know, you don't want to peg an animal's color down to a set list because there's, you know, Fluffy might get insulted and shit in your shoe. Yeah, but what happens if it's a calico cat? There's four colors, right? So a numeric... If I do a three comma, oops, three comma one, that means I can store 99.9. .9. So the first digit identifies how many numbers are total, the second digit identifies what the precision is. So if you're working with money, you'd probably do, you know, four comma two, three or five comma two. All right, color, we'd do a var car, and I'm running out of room. I'm going to abridge it to VC for now. Wait. How much precision do you need? Not whoever said that. I'm not being funny. I'm just saying, think about the precision, right? A double takes a lot of room. So, for example, a numeric will occupy, if you look, for example, a 3 comma 1 numeric will occupy 3 bytes. Well, yeah, but if you do 3 comma 1 for the weight, it's 99 point, if it, you do it in kilos, so this animal is 76.5 kilos. So how much precision do you really need? 3 comma 1, maybe 4 comma 1 in case it's a brood of a bear. You, you do, then the bird goes into grams, which means you make the digit on this side bigger, so you could weigh the dog, you put in their weight in grams. Right? And then it's all displayed because if you pick, you can theoretically tweak based on the type of animal what this actually means. You store the data in there the same way for everything and then you use the type to actually start flipping the display. But well, that's UI work, not database work. 
So the weight, you'd probably have again a numeric, probably four comma two. So that would handle. Yeah, actually four comma two. We'd actually need six comma two. You know, 100 kilos. That's a big freaking dog. Well, that's part of the design process. You have to make that choice, right? We're in Canada, so we're going to go with metric. My brain goes to pounds automatically whenever I weigh anything because that's how I grew up. My kids don't understand pounds. They only understand kilos and grams. They've, they've finally been brainwashed to the point where the imperial system's finally leaving, you know. Good for them because, you know, same thing. They don't understand foot and inches, centimeters and, and meters. I'm like, so I do the conversion in my head all the time now when I'm talking to them. Gender. Gender should actually be its own table. I just don't have room here. So I'm going to rewrite gender in blue. Actually, I'm going to do it in green. And, and it's going to go off to infinity on that side. We already know what a reference table looks like, so we don't need to keep drawing them over and over and over again. Coat type. Again, that one here, we could go with a, a VAR car. 25 is probably enough. Size. What kind of, what are we referring to size? Are we talking about small, medium, large? Height. What are we calling size, right? So we're probably measuring length. But depending on the kind of animal, you measure it differently, right? You measure a cat by two measurements up long. Same thing with dogs. But with a bird, how do you measure a freaking bird? That's weight. But size is iffy. So I'm going to leave a question mark. In other words, we could go back to the original people and ask them, what do you want here? We don't know. We, as a group, we haven't come to that conclusion yet. Okay, diet. Diet can be really complicated. So we might want to use something called a text field. Again, with the medical issues, that'd be a text. Disposition would be text. Why? It allows people to type in a minor, a minor story to explain all of it. Text, text, and text. So this is the next step. Afterwards, you do the same thing to each of these tables. Like all the reference tables, name is probably a Varkar 25, Varkar 50. Date of birth. That would be a date. Date of birth? Not really. I mean, most, most places except for hospitals really don't care when you popped on out to this earth. The moment, the very moment your existence made a difference in the world. You know, some people care, very few people care. Um, same thing here, position. Honestly, that should probably be a drop down. Um, you know, gender again should be a drop down. So that's basically what we have here. So that's where I'm going to take a break for a minute. And after that, I'm going to start talking about how we handle some of these kinds of data separately. So I'll call a five-minute break, and I'll literally be five minutes. If anybody wants to take a picture of that before you erase it, here's your chance. It is on video, but do you want to bet that my video is going to survive? All right, we're back to the front. All right, no problem. So what happens next is when I've talked about, remember I put an asterisk next to address because I said I got to talk about that a little later. There are some things called design patterns. And that used to be actually a really big part of my lectures before I was forced to make them more theory-based. Now design patterns exist in everything. Right, in software engineering, there's design patterns. There's certain if you do certain things a certain way, you know it's going to work. When you build houses, there's certain patterns you have to follow. A house should have a door so you can get in it. 
There should be windows. You know, normally your two by fours are so many inches apart. Otherwise, it's not up to code. There's patterns. Now, when you think about database, there's very specific patterns. And one of the patterns that you see often is addresses. And when you talk about an address, It gets broken down into multiple pieces. Now, for example, what are the parts that make up an address? When's the last time you fill out an address card or put your address down on something? Right, so depending on how you want to do it, they'll classify, but they actually usually often put it in the same slots. So often you'll have street, Street one and two. So this could be one, two, three, some street, apartment 12. So this is the first two that you'll see. The next one is usually, yeah, city. The next one after that is, at least here if you're in Canada. If you're trying to make this as international as possible, this phrase you use is called political division. That may that way you don't offend anybody, right? It's a province, it's a state, it's a county, it's a ward. You know, insert whatever way your country split up here. What do you have after this? Postal code, and contrary to what Americans think, the zip code is still a postal code. It's a postal code. And after that, what else do you have left? Are we thinking international or not? Well, yeah, that has nothing to do with whether or not it's international or not. Yeah. Well, I'm just talking about addresses, not the person's. Yeah, yeah, it does, but that's, I'm talking about addresses in general, right? Not talking about specific kinds of addresses. An address in general has this pattern. Every address in the world has this pattern. There are exceptions to the rule. City, for example, if you're in the UK, a lot of their forms have two city lines. Why? Because the UK is stupid. They have such and such a town near such and such a other town. Yeah, really, literally, I, I kid you not. Once you get outside of the big cities, you end up with these weird little, this town's near another town. And the, the city lines aren't big enough in most systems, so they actually create two city lines. Uh, some parts of the world need three si uh, street numbers, three street lines. Um, the UK, again, is actually one of those stupid places where you can actually have an entire building and not have a street number. So our UK office is at a place called Intech House on some other location, and there's no street number attached to it. The Postal Service knows where this building is magically. It's just the UK's addresses are really dumb. Um, so that's how you handle an address. And then you've got to think about the size of the data, right? You've got an address. You probably want to stick a VAR car on that, and you probably want to give it 50. Why? Because it's usually enough to handle most addresses. There are times where 50 is not enough. And you end up having to do more, so you need to have a good sampling of the data that's going to go into it. So you may need to make that bigger, but 50 is usually good. Same thing with city. Now, the big culprit for city is France. They, they've got some city names that are like that long. Saint-Jean-de-Bastille sur la mer bleue. No, no, it's, uh, it's a town called Saint-Jean-de-Bastille next to the sea, Blue Sea. But that's, you know, they got really long city names. So how much room do you want to give for a city? I had 30 to 50. So since Varkars don't take up any extra room, give it extra space. Don't make everything Varkar 255 because then you're losing the, the point of the data. I'm going to skip province for a second. Postal code. In Canada, how much room do you need? 
Are you keeping the space or not? If you, seven, if you have seven, if you have the space. In the UK, do you know how long a postal code is in the UK? Same size as Canada. That's just letters and numbers are rotated. If you're in the US, how long is your postal code? No, it's not. No, it's not. It's five plus five and one. Because they've now discovered that the four at the other end weren't enough. They ran out again. So they added another digit. So the way it works is you got the actual postal code dash routing office. <coughs> Whereas where in the States often the postal codes will cover an entire city block. In Canada, a postal code covers four to six houses. Like I look at my postal code, it covers, if I remember right, the house to my left, if I was facing the street, and the three houses to my right. They share my postal code. Surprisingly enough, our postal code system is able to handle that just fine. So postal code depends on what you're targeting. And if you're just doing Canada, all you need is six or seven. If you're doing Americans, 11 or 12. Other countries have anywhere from five to seven digits. I think China just went to eight. I'm not 100% sure. So here again, VARCAR 12 if it's international, VARCAR 7 if you're domestic. Street 2. Now, as you notice, I didn't touch country and province. Why? If they're drop down menus, that means they come from what? A reference table. Suddenly, our province becomes province ID and country becomes country ID. Suddenly, that's what your structure looks like. Each province belongs to a country or state or political division, whatever you want to call this. So each country has a set number of provinces. Each address belongs to a specific province. Realistically, you might not even need the country here because you can get it from the province. But a lot of people like including the country here because it makes them feel happy. So when you talk about an address, so when you talk about creating, whether it's a billing address, a mailing address, a, you know, insert other address here, this is the standardized address structure. This is called the design pattern. This is what addresses look like in the system. Pretty much every system except things that are ancient and archaic. A, a, a lot of old systems for province will have like a car two. Allows you to type in two characters. CA for California. Country, two characters. You'd have to type in US, CA. And there was no Enforcement of rules, so you could have CACA, California, Canada, which was bad. So this, enforce, this is the modern design pattern for addresses. Whenever you see a design and you say address, for example, a student, they talk about their home address. You could literally just grab this pattern, slap it in your design, done. That's a standard. Now, here comes an anecdote. When I first started where I'm at now, 18 years ago, I inherited the website database. Not the website, the database for the website. And the individual, and I'm being nice because I'm using the word individual, not the word I'm thinking, allowed free form text entry into province and into, into country. You could type whatever the heck you wanted. Did you know there's at least seven ways of putting United States? US. USA, U.S. dot A dot, U dot S dot S dot. United States, United States of America, America. Yeah, oh yeah, there's, I saw it written in there so many different ways. 
or just straight up US. Same thing with their states and provinces. I've seen Ontario done three ways, Ontario, ON, and ONT. Same thing with American states, you had California, CA, all kinds of stuff. And then one day the guy in marketing asked me to run a report for him. Ask him to give me all the American customers that had registered in the last two months. And I had to find every variation of every United States. Do you know how long after that report, before the, dev, the website had this kind of structure behind it? Two days. It took me two days to clean up the data and attach it to this kind of structure. It wasn't an exact match to this structure, but it was pretty close. Um, I was really angry at this person. I was glad they no longer worked there um, because I would have had words with a two by four. Well, you got to hammer your point home. You are an idiot. These are for your knees. Okay, so this is an address. Anybody want to take a picture of this before I move on? Allow me to move out of the way. Send me that. I like that. All right, it's getting erased. Okay, so that took care of the address design pattern. That's one of the big ones. Another one is when you talk about names. A person's name. There's a couple of ways of handling this. There's the universal name field, which is fine. And in this one here, you'd go with a Varkar, probably 75, because you want to handle you know, all the weird names, the big long names, and the way names that have the same name repeated three times. If you're going to go for a single name field, this has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage, it's simple to deal with. The disadvantage, what happens if you want to search for a specific part of a person's name? You want to just search for last name. How do you do that with a universal field like this, especially if they've got one of those fun names that they don't have any hyphens, but the last name is actually two separate words? How do you search that? That's a pain. So what you may actually want to do is break it down. And those would be var cars. Probably make them 25 each. Notice I didn't put down middle name. Why? Because you don't put in middle name unless you really require it. If you, unless you have a, and the only time middle names get used is usually with legal requirements. HR, student databases. I mean, when was the last time you went to a website to, I don't know, signed up for hum, Humble Bundle and you wanted to know, if they, if, did they ever ask you for your middle name? No. They don't care. They don't even care what your name is. They just want your credit card. But, you know, that's the pattern for a name. It's actually really straightforward. One of the worst ones, though, is email. An email, you always want to use a var car because you never know how long it's going to be. However, how long do you think you need for an email address? Pardon? 50, 5, 0? That at a, at a minimum. At a minimum. Honestly? I put in 100 because I got burned once. I always go minimum emails, 100 to 150. Uh, back when I used to work for a company called Compaq, after they, after they bought out digital, before they got bought out by HP. So I was there for all three. But during that time, I worked for a department called, I supported the technicians for a group called UAS, User Application Support. So if somebody went to digital, or come back and bought 500 PCs, they would be given a contract saying, call, connect this phone extension number to your phone switch, and if your end users have a problem with it, and you had, they list off the top five pieces of software, <coughs> you know, Word, Access, Internet Explorer, whatever, they got problems with this, they call this extension, it would ring our phones. 
So instead of calling Microsoft support, they could call our technicians that are trained for helping them specifically. <coughs> and one of our customers was the government of Ontario. And we had uh, one time where a technician called me up and says, I can't get my client's email address into the system. I can't get it to fit. And I had to set up to Varkar 50. I'm like, how long is this email address? And then the person explained to me how it used to work. Their name, they were set up as follows. Full first name, period, full last name, at department in English, dash, department in French, dot, Ontario, dot, O-N, dot C, dot G-O-V. It's all been collapsed now to a lot shorter than that. So, even that, that sounds like that can't be that bad at all. This lady's name, she had a hyphenated first name and a hyphenated last name. And it, was, it wasn't like Billy Joe. I honestly don't remember what it was, but her last name was 27 letters long. And her first name, if I remember, was about 15 letters long. 15 plus the period plus the dash. Right? So it stuck that. I was almost at the 50 right off the bat. Then the department name. Resources Natural Resources. Dot O-N, dot G-O-V, you know. So she broke my 50. Uh, if I remember right, I think her email address is hitting almost over 90 characters. I learned that day, never less than 100. Ever. It takes up no extra room. Give your email address lots of space. It's an important one. Okay. Last one, because it's, we're getting close to the end here. Phone numbers. Holy crap, phone numbers. It's the shittiest thing to store in a database. Why? Because everybody does it differently. Canadian phone number. How much room do you need for a Canadian phone number? Ten digits, right? Are you including the brackets, the dashes? Or are you just doing dashes or using periods? <laughs> there we go. He threw, he just threw the grenade and I was about to. It gets so complicated at that point. Now, even that, a lot of those forms, what they do is they pre-fill it out and they store it formatted. So they'll store it with the area code, the exchange, and the actual phone number. Eh? Well, the, 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 that's just the format of the data. It has nothing to do with the size of the data. It's the format of the data. The format is handled by the front end. You can actually get the database to enforce the rules, but you know, realistically, you should get the formatting done at the other end. Same thing with the phone number. A lot of places will just store the digits of the phone number. They don't use an integer because that really sucks. They actually use a varchar field because you can't do a sub-search inside of a, an integer. Try finding 613 inside of an integer, but you only want integers that start with 613. 613, 6130. 61,300 and something, right? So how do you find that? It's really painful. What you actually do is you take it, you would cast it to a character and then do the match, which is dumb. Therefore, just keep it as a character. If you're going to do that, you might as well just store the formatting with it so it's easy to read and you don't have, there's less processing on the return. Which leads me to international, right? So in Canada, if you're going to store the formatted version, you need bracket, number, 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 bracket. Technically, you're supposed to have a space. A lot of people don't know that. This is back in the dark ages from when I grew up. Then you have, you have a space, that's six. Three more digits, the dash. So we're up to 10 plus four. So 14 characters. I'm saying that's just Canadian, right? When you throw in the international, you got plus plus zero four four. We're gonna call the UK. And then you got the weird set of phone numbers and they're different in every single country. You end up storing it as a Varkar field and you let them type whatever the heck they want. It sucks because they don't always put the plus plus. It's painful. There's a lot of controls they can do to do the formatting, but it's possible. So for phone numbers, if it's Canada, it's 14. I know you're not listening, but I can't even hear myself talk. Thank you. 
In Canada, it's 14. Just give yourself 14, you're safe. Now, usually somebody at this point says, what about extension numbers? Put them in a separate field, please. When somebody says extension number this, it's getting obnoxious. I know I'm boring, but you know, go talk in the hall. Extension number is stored as a separate field. Why? Because it's not part of the phone number. It's extra colory data. It's not as important as the phone number. You can always get a hold of a person. No, you can't say that. Theoretically, you can always get a hold of the person by their extension. By their main phone number, you call the switchboard, then you can get transferred into the person, usually. But store the extension as a separate field, whatever size you want, VARCAR 10 even. I mean, the college's extension numbers here now are what, five digits long? Six digits long? They're really long now. Um, so that's phone numbers. So, so far you've seen addresses, email addresses, names, phone numbers are 14. Um, that pretty much covers all the major, P all the major data types. If you follow those rules, it's pretty good. Other pieces of data that you may want to keep track of is when you talk about money, two decimal places, three decimal places, pardon? Well, you want, uh, you want to use a numeric because numeric allows you more than two decimal places of precision. There are some currencies that use three decim decimal places of precision. Um, so with money, don't forget you'd use a numeric And the rule is length, precision. And what you need to do is you need to think about what the biggest number can be. And with that, you have to do some research. If you're talking about a grocery store, rarely do you get, you know, a grocery order that's more than a thousand bucks. We're not talking about Costco, we're talking Loblaws. Actually, it's really easy to blow a thousand bucks at Loblaws too, because they're so expensive. So let's just say we wanted a maximum of $10,000.99. So how many digits is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven digits, right, for 10,000. However, we also need to add the decimal places. Actually, I'm missing a zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Whoever said 10, you were good to go. So this would be 10, comma, 2 would allow us to store Nine nine. That's the biggest number we can store in that. If you try to put in a bigger number than that, it just blows up. I said if you had ten thousand, but the problem is you can't tell it to stop at ten thousand. I use ten thousand as the number of places, right? So ten thousand nine nine thousand occupies the same amount of room. It, you're thinking about spaces, not actual numbers. Which is the biggest problem people have when they start working with databases is you worry too much about the data and not how to represent the data. So part of the learning process is learning how to represent the data as opposed to the data itself. Because you really don't care what the data is. Like honestly, you don't care what the data is. Do you care what a person is called, honestly? Well, fine, I don't, but you know. I don't care what people are called, but I do care how to represent their information in the database. Oh, shit. You're right. I did stop at the right spot. A little tired. There you go. Thanks. Thanks for calling me out. Because somebody else said 10, and I'm going, wait, that's not right. They were right. I they were wrong. I was right. Because I stopped there the first time. So anyways, that's 10,000. Sorry, my bad. Oh, we're not in Quebec. There. Now, yeah, so 8-2 for 10,000, my bad. I shouldn't listen to the pin gallery at the back. Um, so yeah, you worry about how you represent the data, you don't worry about the data itself. The data tells you a pattern of what the, how to represent it. So you take a sampling of the data and you find the best possible match to it. So same thing, when you look at all the names, if you're doing a da uh, database and you're all worried about is Canadian names, you know, two fields, 25 each is usually is good for 99% of the time. You're going to create a database for Costa Rica. 25 for the first name, 25 for the last name is not enough. Not even close. Same thing for Italian, Spanish names. They can have long. Japanese names can be long. 
So what you want to do is you look at the data, take a sample of the data, figure out what the, what the lower and the upper bounds are, and you base your database on that. I don't know. I've never had to write one of those. I, odds are, if I was handling that case, I'd probably, you said Indonesian, I'd probably be writing a database just for the Indonesians. Therefore, the structure would match their country. If it's an international one, well, that's the way you get to the point where his last name required is the first name required. You know, you have to make choices, right, what you are and are not going to allow. Yeah, yeah, I've received a lot of data that looks like that at work, NN. You'll get that. And that's just how it is. Um, sometimes you have to make your database work for 90% of the cases, and the last 10% is edge cases. And you try to find the best way to accommodate them, but you don't always accommodate them. It's like anything else in the world, right? You can't make every tree hugger happy. It's impossible. Therefore, you can't make every user happy. You can't have the database ever be perfect because it's impossible to be perfect because we live in a changing world. And you know, if you want to achieve success in your changing world, you have to be flexible. Therefore, you try to aim for the most flexible design as you can, knowing there's always going to be problems. And you aim to mitigate the problems to the smallest subset as possible. Thus, when you're picking all your data types, you want to give yourself room, but you don't want to overdo it either. Or when you normalize your database, you want to give yourself space, but you don't want to overdo it either. Because if you overdo it, it gets complicated to work with, and then it just breaks. All right. So this week's labs are a work period. Lab 5 is not assigned. Don't worry about the due dates. I haven't had a chance to go through and fix all the due dates. This next week, uh, I'm going to try to keep the lecture short so I can give some time after the lecture to help people with their assignments. So I'll still try to give lecture time towards work period. Um, and then next week you'll be working on lab five, starting out on lab five. Unless you want to go now, but you know, it's one of those things. The what? The test date has a correct due date. It, it has since last week. It's due next Friday, I think. Next Tuesday, okay, yeah. That's right, it's due next Tuesday because originally it was due tonight. And I said, okay, I'm going to make it due in two weeks instead. But I'm not giving you a drop-dead time instead. This is, this is it. Hang on.